Testament. Uh, it's found in the book of Job, and I want to continue on that Job uh, story again, uh, as I did last week. But uh, this was a great message. It was primarily given to Job himself from one of his friends, not his three friends, but it was a message correcting and reproving and rebuking and giving instruction to both Job and his three friends what the Bible calls them miserable com uh, com comforters and counselors. Uh, and so we're going to look at that in some detail today. It's a very powerful message under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But let me just mention this. One of the reasons why we're digging so deep into this story of Job is because it's been so terribly misrepresented and misunderstood that it has caused many Christians to misunderstand the goodness of God or doubt it and not have any faith in the goodness of God. You know, it leaves you with the impression, if it's misrepresented, that uh, God will do anything he wants whenever he wants to do it. And that's not true, not, not carefully true. God's sovereign, but he still has guidelines that he will follow based upon what he has promised. And we don't want to misrepresent those promises or misunderstand God's goodness and his mercy. Uh, and, and as long as we have doubts in that, and Job, the story of Job, when mishandled and misrepresented, leaves doubt in Christian, even Christians' minds, where it leaves them sick, suffering, and afflicted. We want to remove that out of your life. We want to get it out of your thought life. Next also I want to point out that Job, while he was the greatest man in his generation, and obviously a man of God and a man of faith, his life was not, and this story was not a testimony to his faith, and it also reflects on the fact that Job as a man was just like the rest of us. He was mortal, he was capable of failing and falling, and he did just that, and we'll look at that today. Also, I wanna point out that the book of Job is a part of the whole counsel of God, and there's 42 chapters in this particular book, and yet most people, most Christians even, only know about the first two chapters and, and the last chapter, where God allowed the devil to get at him or appointed Job to suffer, and then later he blessed him uh, with double at the end. But all that other detail on the inside is neglected or overlooked, and God has a message in there, and we've got to pay attention to that message. Also, uh, some have ridiculously claimed that Job was the greatest illustration of faith for all Christians to follow, and yet not one Bible writer ever referred to Job's faith or used it as an illustration of great faith. Yes, great patience, a man that did endure, but a man that suffered under circumstances that he did not understand, and he spoke erratically eventually. And, uh, and, and so all that is there in there, and there's a lesson in, the, in, in making sure we study the whole counsel of God. And so we're going to look today at chapters 32 through 37 and then uh, 38 when God finally speaks up. Uh, but Elihu here is the fourth man, I call him the fourth man in Job's fire. He's not one of the three comforters that had come to his aid and, and tried to comfort him or counsel him and they were miserably uh, hurting him and wounding him instead of helping him and strengthening him. So here in chapter 32, when all the conversation has finally stopped between Job and his three friends, chapter 32 verse 1 says this, so there were, so these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Now that's God's interpretation. That's not just Job or Elihu pointing this out, but the book, the writer, inspired writer that wrote this down said, Job was righteous in his own eyes. In verse two it says, and then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barashel, the Buzite, of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God, and also against his three friends for his wrath kindled because they had found no answer or no solution or gave him no peace and yet they had condemned him. Now Elihu had waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. And then finally when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. And Elihu the son of Barashel the Buzite answered and said, I am young. And you are very old. Therefore I was afraid and did not show my opinion or the knowledge that I have. I said days should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in a man and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. Therefore I said, hearken to me or listen to me, I will also show you my opinion or my knowledge, the things that I have gained and grown in the knowledge of over my lifetime under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 
And he says in verse 11, Behold, I waited for your words. I gave ear to your reasons while you searched out what to say. Yes, I attended unto you, and behold, there was none of you that convinced Job or that answered his words. Lest you should say, We have found out wisdom. God thrusteth him down, not man. Verse 14, Now, now he hath not directed his words against me, and neither will I answer him with your speeches. They were amazed. They answered no more, and they left off speaking. And when I had waited, for they spoke not, but stood still and answered no more. In verse 17, he said, I said, I will answer also my part. I will also show my opinion and my knowledge. For I am full of matter or full of words. The spirit within me constraineth me or urges me to speak this out. Verse 19, Behold, my belly is as wine which has no vent and is ready to burst like new bottles. I will speak that I may be refreshed. I will open my lips and answer. Now, when you're filled with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and I'm just pausing here for a moment, there, there is something that just wants to come out. Don't quench that spirit. You want to analyze it, and when you do present it, it it's, it's needs to be presented because other people can examine it. They need to hear it. Maybe it'll bless them and help them to understand, or maybe you will need to be corrected. But under the true inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you're going to be refreshed when you speak out what you say. There's so many times in the Bible we see where, for, for Christians, they were told to be silent and not to preach and not to teach. Even the apostles, they were whipped and beaten for preaching and teaching the gospel, and they said, we must do it. There's something about being refreshed under those circumstances. Verse 21, it says, Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person, neither let me give flattering titles unto men. For I know not to give flattering titles, for in doing so my maker would take me away. Chapter 33, verse 1. Therefore, Job, I pray thee, hear my speeches and hearken to all my words. Behold now, I have opened my mouth, my tongue has spoken in my mouth, my words shall be of the uprightness of my heart, and my lips shall utter knowledge clearly. The Spirit of God hath made me, uh, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. If you can answer me, set your words in order before me, stand up. Behold, I am, according to thy wish in God's stead, I also am formed out of clay. Behold, my terror shall not uh, make you afraid, neither shall my, my hand be heavy upon you. Surely, Job, you have spoken in my, uh, my hearing, and I have heard the voice of your words, saying, I am clean, without transgression. I am innocent, neither is there iniquity in me. Behold, he findeth occasion, or... Um, uh, Elihu was saying what, or, or explaining what Job had been saying in his arguments to the three friends that here had been bringing him under condemnation. He said, "Behold, God finds me, finds an occasion against me. He counts me for an enemy. He puts my feet, he puts my feet in the stocks. He marks all my paths. And behold, in this thou shalt not be just. I will answer thee that God is greater than man." Verse 13, why do you strive against him? For he gives not account of any of his matters. God does not have to defend himself. God does not have to explain himself. The secret things belong unto the Lord. The things that God has revealed to us, they, they belong to us. We should, should search those things out. But in many occasions, it's the glory of God. Proverbs 25, 2 says, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. God has secrets. He knows things that he does not impart to us. He doesn't give them to us. He doesn't share them, most likely because they would do more damage to us than helping us, because we just cannot fathom how deep his understanding and how deep his wisdom is and how, how, uh, how excellent his power and glory is. So when you don't know what, if God's hiding something from us or keeping it from us, it's a secret thing, don't bring assumptions out. That's how we get tricked of the devil. He'll come in there, and once you start making assumptions, and you start saying, well, the reason God let, let, let uh, Job suffer was, must have been for this, or it must have been for that, or I think it was this, or I think it for that, you open the door to the devil to bring in tormenting fear and confusion in your mind. And God's not the author of confusion. Let alone those things that you don't yet know regarding God. Anything that you don't, don't speculate. Don't, don't you know, assume something or per, be presumptuous. Just sit there and say, I don't know. 
The word of God makes it very clear that no, and this is one of the lessons in the book of Job, that no man can search out all the things of God. There are certain things God retains, and he doesn't defend himself for retaining it. So again, uh, Job says this, or Elihu says this to Job. Why do you strive against him? For he gives not account of any of his matters or his words. For God speaketh once, yes, twice, and yet man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instructions that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide man from pride, or keep man from pride. Now let's go to chapter 34. It goes on to say this, Furthermore, Elihu answered and said, Hear my words, O you wise men. This is talking now to uh, the three friends of Job. And he says, Hear my words, you wise men, and give ear unto me, you that have knowledge. For the ear trieth words as the mouth tasteth meat. Let us choose, uh, choose to us judgment, and let us know among ourselves what is good. For Job hath said, I am righteous, and God has taken away my judgment. Should I lie against my right? My wound is incurable and without transgression. Verse 7, what man is like Job who drinks up scorning like water, which goeth in, in company with the workers of iniquity and walks with wicked men? For he hath said, it profits me nothing. Uh, that uh, uh, he should, God should delight himself with God, or I should delight myself with God. Therefore hearken unto me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. And this is what Job had eventually began to say in his crisis situation. He began to blame God. He didn't see any fault in himself. He, didn't, he felt he was innocent, and he said God has just allowed this or he's doing this. He actually even thought it was God doing this. The hand of God is on me. He, God is slaying me. He'd made those comments. Now, not in the beginning. Again, in the first two chapters, we were told that he did not sin with his lips, and he did not charge God foolishly with his words. But beginning in chapter 3, it says Job lifted up his voice, and he cursed his day. And then all the dialogue and all the conversation that took place between him and his three friends, each going after, after him, bringing him under condemnation, in his defense, he foolishly spoke against God. He foolishly began to show from the abundance of his heart with his words was found out that he thought he was more righteous, more, you know, fair than God was. So uh, let's pick up reading here at verse 9. For Job hath said, it profits a man nothing that he should delight himself with God. Therefore hearken unto me, ye men of understanding. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. For the work of a man shall be rendered unto him, and, the cause, ev and, and cause every man to find according to his ways. Verse 12. Yes, surely God will not do wickedly, neither will the Almighty pervert judgment. And so, uh, in other words, Job was the one that was confused, and the three men were confused, and Elihu wasn't confused. He wasn't speculating, he wasn't drawing assumptions, but he was defending God, where God didn't feel needed uh, the need to defend himself. But Elihu was speaking under the inspiration, and he was speaking by the Spirit of God. And he was an Old Testament saint who had the Holy Spirit. And it's amazing what, what he was allowed or capable of doing in this tremendous sermon and message. Go over here to verse uh, chapter 34, verse 21. It says, for his eyes are upon the way, talking about God now, for God's eyes are upon the ways of man, and he sees all of his goings. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. For he will not lay upon man more than that which is right, that he should enter into judgment with God. Again, Elihu is defending God. And while God does not reveal the reason why he allowed Satan to attack him, uh, and, 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 we, and we don't know. God is not specific or does not defend himself or does not specifically tell us why. But it does say here very clearly under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that God and anything God allows on man is right. 
and, he, and uh, no man has a right to enter into judgment against God. So you might not understand sometimes the circumstances that you're in, and we need to talk about those circumstances. We need to know how to react when those circumstances take place. Faith will count it all joy. It will rejoice in the Lord in, in, in contrary circumstances, in dire, a horrible, hard, hard circumstances. But fear, fear will begrudge. It'll complain, it will murmur. And that's the difference right there. Job began to complain. He began to murmur. He began to gripe. Uh, gripe. In the beginning, he held his integrity. But then in chapter 3, he lost it for a season until he received correction. First now, as we're looking from Elihu, and then from God afterward. He will receive correction, and thank God he will receive it. You know, there's a lot of people in this world, a lot of Christians, that they will not receive correction. They're just going to stand their feet, you know, they, they think when you're done all to stand, stand there for. They're not putting on the armor of God. They're putting on a stubbornness that is you know, determined that I'm, I'm settled in my ways and I'm not going to change. I don't need to improve. I don't need to get better. I don't need to learn anything more. I don't need to know anything more. I'm just trusting God, just leaving it all up to God. And fine, trust God, but isn't it much better to grow in the knowledge of God and come into the knowledge of the truth so that now, now your faith is based on some substance and some evidence and it's got a firm foundation and you can release your faith confidently knowing that God said it, you believe it, and that settles it. It's a decision that you've got to make. It's not just left up in the air, my friends. This is one of the reasons why we do not see the signs, wonders, and miracles in our generation. It's not that they've ceased or God has decided not to use them or we don't need them. We need them today more than any day in, our, in, in any generation. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. But the church as a whole has just sat down on its hands and it's just kind of wringing its hands and just sitting there doing nothing, saying it's all up to God. It's all up to God. Well, my friends, there's a connection. God has given to you his spirit. And greater is he that is in you than he that's in this world. You, behold, you are the sons of God. And even though you don't understand it all, stand up like a son of God and be led by the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk a little bit about this in the weeks to come regarding how to be led by the Spirit instead of being led by and controlled by circumstances. God doesn't want his children to be led by circumstances. He wants us to be led by the Spirit of God. Those that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So let's pick up reading here, uh, verse 35 of chapter 34. Job has spoken... Elihu says, Job has spoken without knowledge, and his words are without wisdom. My desire is that Job may be tried unto the end because of his answers for wicked men. For he addeth rebellion unto his sin. He claps his hands among us and multiplies his words against God. Now, these are bold accusations that Elihu is saying, and many people would sit here and probably even thought that Elihu was one of those three miserable comforters, and so they've ignored all this detail that Elihu says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and they just say it's all bad stuff, but God confirms what Elihu says. He backs it up. He agrees with Elihu when it comes to chapter 38 uh, down through the rest of the story. But let's pick up here reading chapter 35, verse 1. Elihu spoke moreover and said, Do you think that this, that this uh, is, to, is right, that you should, you should say, My righteousness is more than God's? For you have said, What advantage will it be for, for you or me or anyone? And what profit shall I have if I cleanse, if I am if, if I be cleansed from my sins? What pro He's questioning now, why even ask forgiveness or be forgiven? Verse uh, 16 says, Therefore doth Job, well, let me back up a little bit. Verse 13, Surely God will not hear vanity, neither will the Almighty regard it. Although thou, you say that, uh, although you say you shall not see him, yet judgment is before him. Therefore trust thou in him. But now, because it is not so, he hath visited in his anger, yet he knoweth it not in great extremity. And then in verse 16, therefore doth Job open his mouth in vain. He multiplies his words without knowledge. Again, he supports that, backs that up. A second time he says, Job is multiplying his words. The Bible says we will be justified by our words and we will be, be condemned by our words. By Job's own words, 
Although he was a man of great integrity in the beginning, he fell and his words and his pain on the inside overwhelmed him and he multiplied his words against God and without knowledge. Then he goes over here and um, just come down here to chapter 37 and look, we looked at this last week. Elihu finishes his words and then God will speak. And Listen carefully or read this story along with me. It says in verse 23, Elihu says, touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment or verdict and decisions, and he is full of justice, and he will not afflict. This is one of the lessons that we've got to learn from the book of Job. It was not God afflicting Job. It was the devil. Yes, the hedge was, God lifted the hedge of protection against him for reasons we don't clearly know. There's a hint, a couple of hints of why, but God does not tell us exactly why, although those hints do give us some information that we should, uh, you know, add as evidence and, and substance from the word of God to base our faith on. But don't question God. Say this about God. James learned this in the New Testament. God will not afflict. If any man is tempted, tried, or tested, let not that man think he will, re I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If any man is tested, tempted, or tried, don't let him say God has, is doing it to him. God does not tempt or, and, and, uh, and, and afflict us, and neither does he, uh, is he afflicted. And so, again, touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent, superior, and supreme in power and in judgment, and is full of and plenty of justice, he will not afflict. Men do therefore fear him or reverence him, and he respects not any that are wise of heart. Now, immediately finishing that statement, God now intervenes. Finally, God speaks up. And again, God does not have to defend himself, but he, he makes it very clear he's, it's time for him to say something. Then it says, then the Lord answered Job, out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? He's not very happy with Job. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer me if you can. Were you, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof? If you know, and who hath stretched out the line upon it? Where, whereupon are the foundations? And, and therefore, fa and how is it fashioned, fastened? And who laid the corner of, of the stone thereof? And so God lays into him here in chapter 38, chapter 39. I don't want to take the time to read all of it. If you're interested, you can read it for yourself. And you can see that God is very disappointed with Job. And he is rebuking him. He's correcting him. It says in chapter 40, verse 1, Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that, he that reproveth God, let him answer. And then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. And then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Give uh, gird up thy loins now like a man, and I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. Will you also disannul my judgment? Will you condemn me, that you may be righteous? And so he lays into him, and finally in chapter 42 it says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak, and I will demand of thee, and declare, and, and declare or uh, instruct me. And verse 5, it, Job says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Wherefore I hate myself, and repent in dust and ashes. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, and the Lord then the Lord spoke unto his three friends and told them to repent, that they had not spoken what Job had said, which was right, which was repentance. And so Job had repented, and God had Job pray for his three friends, and then God blessed Job with abundance, twice as much, double of all that he had had. Now, the lessons, let's just close here today with some of the lessons. Number one, 
one of the most important lessons is even the greatest men of God can fail, fall, and will need at times reproof, rebuke, uh, correction, and instruction in righteousness and in faith. Another thing is, we, a lesson from Job is how not to counsel. Those three wonderful friends that loved Job had poor counsel. They brought him under condemnation instead of giving him liberty. It would have been better that they had not spoken to him at all. But also, the book of Job gives us insight into how to, to, how to counsel. Uh, studying the, the words that Elihu had said is a real good remedy of helping people to get right. Another lesson is that no one can search out or understand everything about God. Those things that God wants to reveal to us, search them out, but always understand you'll never understand or be able to search out everything of God. And again, another lesson, God does not have to defend himself and often does not defend himself, just leaves men to their own designs. And if you want to assume things, he'll allow you to assume things. <clears throat> and then I want to go to uh, chapter 3, verse 25. And chapter 3 is very important because, again, that's when Job lifted up his voice and cursed his day. And then he began to multiply his words against God. And one of the things he did reveal uh, that was in his heart, again, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It says here in verse 25, Job said, For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet continual trouble came. Now the point I want you to take note of here is that Job was clearly not in faith. He admits he was not in faith. As a result, actually he was in and serving great fear. Now, although in the beginning Job did not sin with his mouth and did not blame God foolishly, his mind was infected and vexed by the demon spirits. This is how the devil got to him, got into his mind, caused him to be afraid to lose his children, to lose his, his possessions, to even lose his own health and, and, and suffer the indignity of what he suffered when all those boils were all over his body. He said, I greatly feared the things I greatly feared. This is something that we've got to deal with in our lives. Deal with your fears. Bring them to God and admit, God, I've got this fear. I've got this issue. I'm being tormented by the devil with this fear. That's why I can't uh, stand against the wiles of the devil. I've got to resist the, the devil. To resist the devil means get control of your thoughts. Don't let the devil put fear on you. Recognize that fear. The fruit of fear is he is not in safety, you're not at rest, you're at peace, and neither were you quiet. And the results of that is instead of blessing, you get continual trouble. This is a principle you've got to learn. Faith is not allowing fear to come into your mind. Stand up at the word of God. Stand up on the promises of God fearlessly. Come boldly to the throne room of grace in time of need. God will provide, but you've got to believe him. You have a wonderful day. God bless you.